But when it is celebrated, it is most likely that those who are in charge of the event will focus on the Bill of Rights. And as Justice Scalia said, there's more to it than that. That is, without structure, the Bill of Rights would not be at all effective. So today, what we're going to do is to focus on the earliest announcements and defense of rights of Englishmen in the colonies before the Declaration of Independence. But it is this part of the history that is critical to starting the movement towards the Declaration and much of what is involved in these two arguments will be part of the Declaration. So with that in mind, realize that rights have to be understood in the context of power. For today's three thinking points, we have one, the challenges. That's from the last session that I didn't get to the third part, but I'm splitting it up, doing some of that in the opening part and then some of it in the third part. The second part, James Otis and John Adams. This is the focus of today. Search and seizure with James Otis and jury trial with James Otis and John Adams. And finally, the third part, addressing those challenges. Actually, there are many challenges, but I wanna focus on one in particular. And that has to do with too much detail. What do I mean? Well, lawyers have to be heavily involved in detail, certainly for litigation, legislation, and even debate. You have to know your case, that's clear. But sometimes you also have to see the forest and not just the trees. And so, in this session, that's what I'm trying to do. Enough of the detail, but to connect certain dots that I don't think have actually been connected well, if at all. So in that vein, I want to pick up this quote from Justice Scalia. It's from his article on taking the Constitution seriously, which is in the book Scalia Speaks. So let's look at especially the highlighted parts of this. Um, Slide, political philosopher and constitutional scholar, Walter Burns. He, one of his many books was taking the constitution seriously. And Justice Scalia said that he was struck by the notion that only in the United States could you talk about something as being quote, un-American, that you wouldn't say that regarding the French or the Germans. So let's read this bottom part. We consider ourselves bound together, not by genealogy or residence, but by a belief in certain principles. And the most important of these principles are set forth in the Constitution of the United States. Those principles really matter. The problem in our country is that the major media, academia, they don't really support those principles. And the background rhetoric and information that most people are getting is contrary to our actual constitution. And if that keeps up, as it has for a very long time, people will really not know what the basic understanding of our constitution is. And even today, while that has been going on for a long time, now there are actually attacks on the fundamentals about truth, rights, and human nature, in the Declaration itself. If that gets ripped apart, as Justice Scalia points out, that's what holds us together. So with all of that tide of information and rhetoric based on assumptions, unarticulated clearly, but they're actually contradictory to the Republican support for the Republican Constitution, how do you deal with that? That's the difficulty. Justice Scalia knew and he was willing to swim against the tide. The real issue in terms of the difficulty is your willingness to stand up and go against the language that you hear and to question and disagree when people are using and making statements that are simply inconsistent with our constitution at its most fundamental level. I'm not talking about arguing so much particular cases as understanding and emphasizing 
the things in the Declaration, namely about truth, human nature, rights, and the insistence that the original meaning of the Constitution has to be implemented, has to be protected, and it is not just some screwball theory. So as Justice Scalia said in his Senate testimony, he wanted to get down to fundamentals, and that's what we'll attempt to do today. In the same talk or article from the book Scalia Speaks, he talks about the old versus new understandings of the Constitution. He says, no part of the Constitution, neither the structural portions nor the individual guarantees can be preserved for the people by the Supreme Court alone. Some people have that understanding that it's just up to the Supreme Court. No, a Supreme Court fiercely dedicated to preserving that document cannot exist in the midst of a society that does not understand it. The court is at best a safety net. The first and ultimately the most important interpreters of the document are the people's representatives who in turn reflect the understanding of the people. I can tell you from experience that very few members of Congress know anything about the Constitution. And that reflects that their constituents don't know and many simply don't care, don't think it's important. That is a serious situation that Justice Scalia spent his whole time in the Supreme Court attempting to address and correct. And without his example, we would not have the encouragement probably to do so. So let's continue. The court can stand against the distortions of the original understanding produced by the temporary excesses of one brief era. But in the nature of things, the court cannot stand against a departure from our traditional attitudes. Justices are drawn from the same society that shares those new understandings. So if the understanding persists long enough among the people, that new understanding will prevail. We come now to part two. Here's where we're going to go into a little bit of detail about James Otis and John Adams. Otis and Adams are two of the strongest and earliest voices for independence. But even before actually striking for independence, they go through and look at and raise questions about the rights of Englishmen. As we're looking at individuals, it's not necessary for you to agree with everything they stood for, everything they said. It is appropriate to understand two things. They were great men, but great men have great flaws often. And certainly, as between Adams and Jefferson, there was first a great friendship, and then a parting, and then a return to that friendship. And we'll talk more about that as we go along. But whether or not you agree with the particulars, we're looking at men who are and responsible for where we are today. That's really the critical thing to think about. Because if you paid attention and were able to read the three pages I suggested from Novus Ordo Seclorum, Professor McDonald talks about the differences between Northern, which he called the Puritanical Republicanism, and the Southern, which he called the Agrarian Republicanism. Those two differences are represented by Adams and Jefferson. You may be partial to one or the other, or you may be a mix. That's not the point here. The point is to understand some other things about these important men. So first up is James Otis, a very underappreciated founder. He was actually really the first one to kick off the movement towards independence. Although his initial arguments are not for independence, in fact, they're instead for enforcing the rights of Englishmen. Now we talk about general warrants, but it was a particular type of warrant related to admiralty law. And that's kind of critical because he was in fact employed by the customs house. It was his job to be engaged in collecting taxes on imports. He was a loyalist. 
but he quit his position. Why? He refused to enforce these general warrants. And so he went out and represented merchants, and he was attacking in court these warrants. Now, in the speech that he gave, and we're going to hear an actor read, again, our actor, John McConnell, he was losing. <laughs> that is the most important one he lost, but he won the war in the sense that he made the rhetorical argument that carried others in their protest. That is the important thing. Not that he won or lost, he lost. He won the rhetorical battle. That's the whole point. What's really interesting to me is that John Adams was along with James Otis. Adams was a young man at the point, but he was in court with him to take notes. And in fact, it is Adams who reconstructs his speech, which we're going to hear in just a second or so. It's important to realize that the language that was used by the colonists was similar to the British language at the time. We had not become Americans and we didn't Americanize it at this point. So in order to have it read in a way that at least simulates the kind of speech that would have been more common back at the time, our actor Spud McConnell will speak in a simulated accent. Let's hear from him. May it please your honors, I was desired by one of the court to look into the books and consider the question now before them concerning writs of assistance. I have accordingly considered it and now appear not only in obedience to your order, but likewise in behalf of the inhabitants of this town who have presented another petition, and out of regard to the liberties of the subject. And I take this opportunity to declare that whether under a fee or not, for in such a cause as this I despise a fee, I will to my dying day oppose with all the powers and faculties God has given me, all such instruments of slavery on the one hand and villainy on the other, as this writ of assistance is. It appears to me the worst instrument of arbitrary power, the most destructive of English liberty and the fundamental principles of law that ever was found in an English law book. I must therefore beg your honor's patience and attention to the whole range of an argument that may perhaps appear uncommon in many things, as well as to points of learning that are more remote and unusual, that the whole tendency of my design may the more easily be perceived, the conclusions better discerned, and the force of them be better felt. I shall not think much of my pains in this cause as I engaged in it from principle. This speech went on for five hours, so we're not going to play the whole thing. We did the reading of the opening, and I'll have a reading of the closing in a minute. But I want to focus on one of the most important things in the speech, and that is a man's home is his castle. 
he made this phrase famous. Now, one of the most essential branches of English liberty is the freedom of one's house. A man's house is his castle, and whilst he is quiet, he is as well guarded as a prince in his castle. This will, if it should be declared legal, would totally annihilate this privilege. I just want to mention that as time goes on, kind of lose that notion of the home as being a castle. And instead, later on, we get a different idea of what this might be that is protected by the Fourth Amendment against searches and seizures. So what happened to the notion that a man's home is his castle, it became abstracted to a so-called right of privacy. Well, how did that happen? In 1890, Louis Brandeis and his co-author Warren came up with the idea of a tort or a private suit against what they called the right of privacy. This was a new right, but it wasn't said at that time to be a constitutional right. But Louis Brandeis later makes it to the Supreme Court. And there in the Olmstead case, which is an eavesdropping or a recording of a telephone conversation, the court ruled five to four that it was not covered by the Fourth Amendment. However, Brandeis in his dissent put forward the right of privacy that he invented to say that it should be covered by the Fourth Amendment. Later, in what's called the Katz case, Katz versus U.S. in 1967, that view invented by Brandeis was adopted as part of the Fourth Amendment. So it became a right of privacy not tied to the specific words. And you may say, well, gee, we, we do need protection against electronic eavesdropping. After all, they didn't have telephones back then. Yes, I would agree. But it doesn't mean that it's in the Constitution. And it doesn't mean, more importantly, that Congress can't legislate on such matters. There's not a restriction on Congress doing that. Indeed, quite apart from the Constitution, in terms of the Bill of Rights, there is the Commerce Clause and telephone and other electronic means that go across state lines can be regulated through the Commerce Clause. But Congress didn't act until when? The Katz case. The next year, Congress came up with legislation. In other words, Congress is not often paying attention to important things that are affecting change in this country. Many times people think, well, we have to update the Constitution because you know, things change. Well, yes, they do change. The whole point of the structure of the Constitution is to give Congress the power to update statutes as they are needed. What I want to point out is that the court cases from the Supreme Court can become what I call a transmission belt for rhetoric. That is to say, often in the case, the Supreme Court doesn't invent the rhetoric it borrows the rhetoric. In this case, it was a justice who brought his own rhetoric in and it became part of constitutional case law. But it is also quite common in other cases, especially affecting the First Amendment, where the litigants who are challenging certain things will put languages, language in their brief that ends up within the court opinion and that then becomes the rhetorical ground of debate. That is to say, for instance, in the area of the religion clauses, the phrase separation of church and state is out there everywhere. But th that language is not in the text of the Constitution. It was in a letter by Jefferson. That whole concept requires explanation. So now we're going to listen to the close of Otis's five hour speech. And I want you to pay particularly close attention to the word power. It's at the beginning of this clip in the close where Otis is relating what the officer said when he came to issue 
and execute yes. the search warrant. Well, then, said Mr. Ware, I will show you a little of my power. I command you to permit me to search your house for uncustomed goods. And went on to search his house from the garret to the cellar. And then served the constable in the same manner. But to show another absurdity in this writ, if it should be established, I insist upon it, every person by Charles II has this power, as well as custom house officers. The words are, it shall be lawful for any person or persons authorized. What a scene does this open? Every man prompted by revenge, ill humor, or wantonness to inspect the inside of his neighbor's house may get a writ of assistance. Others will ask it from self-defense. One arbitrary exertion will provoke another until society be involved in tumult and in blood. Again, these writs are not returned. Writs in their nature are temporary things. When the purposes for which they are issued are answered, they exist no more. But these live forever. No one can be called to account. Thus reason and the Constitution are both against this writ. Let us see what authority there is for it. Not more than one instance can be found of it in all our law books. And that was in the zenith of arbitrary power, namely in the reign of Charles II, when star chamber powers were pushed to extremity by some ignorant clerk of the exchequer. But had this writ been in any book whatever, it would have been illegal. All precedents are under the control of the principles of law. Lord Talbot says it is better to observe these than any precedents, though in the House of Lords, the last resort of the subject. No acts of Parliament can establish such a writ. Though it should be made in the very words of the petition, it would be void. An act against the Constitution is void. But these prove no more than what I before observed, that special writs may be granted on oath and probable suspicion. The act of William III, that the officers of the plantation shall have the same powers, is confined to this sense, that an officer should show probable ground, should take his oath of it, should do this before a magistrate, and that such magistrate, if he think proper, should issue a special warrant to a constable to search the places. That of Anne can prove no more. Two years later, Otis wrote an important pamphlet called The Rights of British Colonies Asserted. That's in 1763. This was all about the rights of Englishmen. Again, we're not arguing for separation at this point. I would refer you back to chapter two of Novus Ordo Seclorum because there, Professor McDonald talks about the rights of Englishmen. Otis's pamphlet was 18 pages, depending on the copy you have, 16, 18 pages. Out of these 18 pages, I just want to read this particular quote. It's about six in. James Otis, rights of British colonies asserted and proved. Every British subject born on the continent of America or in any other of the British dominions is by law of God and nature, language that we'll see later on in the Declaration, by this common law, the common law of England, and by act of Parliament, exclusive of all charters from the Crown. There's a distinction. He recognizes the distinction. Entitled to all natural, essential, inherent, and inseparable rights of our fellow subjects in Great Britain. Originally, the argument is we just want to be treated like British subjects. Notice that the people in England, nor the people in America, they're not citizens. They're not citizens. They're all subject to the king. Among those rights are the following, which is humbly conceived. No man or body of men, not accepting the parliament justly 
equitably and consistently with their own rights and the Constitution can take away. What follows is a list of rights, some of which show up in the Declaration and elsewhere. But a key part of what he is writing is his repeated reference to Magna Carta. One of the things I gave in the readings for today was a one pager on Magna Carta. And the only person there citing in there is James Otis. Now we know that Magna Carta is something that is often mentioned at least in law school and in law cases. I don't know how familiar most Americans are with it. They should be from civics classes, but who knows these days? In any event, that is supposedly the rock of our liberties going all the way back many centuries. So for a quick summary of what Magna Carta provided, let's go back to Nova Sordo by Professor McDonald. Quote, personal liberty and private rights to property were normally beyond the reach of the king and could be taken from the individual only as provided by the law of the land. We've called that due process since then. This principle was deeply rooted in the English common law and had been confirmed by Magna Carta. Yes, confirmed, but the orig origin of it was that the barons forced King John to concede certain rights. It was never something that kings wanted to give away. Well, if Magna Carta protected individuals the way that Professor McDonald described, how then was it that King George got around that limitation? Well, he went to admiralty law. Why would that matter? Because admiralty law, which is in a way international law or law of nations, is based on the civil law. That is not the common law. And in civil law countries, you don't have a right of jury trial. Otis was famous for the statement, no taxation without representation. But he also should be famous for his discussion about how the king got around jury trial. So let's read the relevant text regarding no taxation without representation. No duties and taxes must be paid without any consent or representation in Parliament, the common law, that inestimable privilege of a jury is also taken away in all trials in the colonies relating to the revenue. If the informers have a mind to go to admiral, the admiralty, think about it. The way to get around the fundamental right to jury trial is to go over to admiralty which is based on the civil law, which doesn't have a jury trial. In other words, this is a nice example of doing an end run around the law. That's what Otis is objecting to. And being one who had worked in customs, he is certainly well positioned to do so. Let's continue. Whereas the admiralty method deprives him of both as it puts his estate in the disposal of a single person and makes the civil law the rule of judgment. And nothing could have been more offensive to somebody who understood the common law in the way that Otis did and other lawyers at the time certainly did. We now turn to John Adams. We've already mentioned him in connection with Otis, but let's look at him more formally. And that is, we know of Adams in terms of his relationship with Thomas Jefferson, they became friends in the Continental Congress, and they worked together on the Declaration. Jefferson did the writing, but Adams was on the committee involved with the Declaration itself. One of the biographies of Adams has been right in referring to him as the American Cicero. For Adams, Cicero was the model statesman, lawyer, advocate, defender of the Republic. So much so was Adams an admirer of Cicero that it carried through to his son, John Quincy Adams, who later became not only president, but who taught rhetoric at Harvard using Cicero. So let's consider John Adams' argument in defense of the British soldiers charged with murder. May it please your honor, 
and the gentlemen of the jury. I am for the prisoners at the bar, and shall apologize for it only in the words of the Marquis Beccaria. If I can but be in the instrument of preserving one life, his blessing and tears of transport shall be a sufficient consolation to me for the contempt of all mankind. As the prisoners stand before you for their lives, it may be proper to recollect with what temper the law requires we should proceed to this trial. The form of proceeding at their arraignment as discovered that the spirit of the law upon such occasions is conformable to humanity, to common sense and feeling, that it is all benignity and candor. And the trial commences with the prayer of the court expressed by the clerk to the supreme judge of judges, empires, and worlds. God send you a good deliverance. We find in the rules laid down by the greatest English judges, who have been the brightest of mankind, we are to look upon it as more beneficial that many guilty persons should escape unpunished that one innocent person should suffer. The reason is because it's of more importance to community that innocence should be protected than it is that guilt should be punished. For guilt and crimes are so frequent in the world that all of them cannot be punished. And many times they happen in such a manner that it is not of much consequence to the public whether they are punished or not. But when innocence itself is brought to the bar and condemned especially to die, the subject will exclaim, It is immaterial to me whether I behave well or ill for virtue itself is no security. And if such a sentiment as this should take place in the mind of the subject, there would be an end to all security whatsoever. I will read the words of the law itself. The rules I shall produce to you from Lord Chief Justice Hale, whose character as a lawyer, a man of learning and philosophy, and as a Christian, will be disputed by nobody living. One of the greatest and best characters the English nation ever produced. His words are these, Tusius simpares errare, inacquientando quam puniendo ex parte, mesirecordiae quam ex parte justicie. It is always safer to err in acquitting than punishing on the part of mercy than the part of justice. The next is from the same authority. Tusius eratu ex parte mitiori. It is always safer to err on the milder side, the side of mercy. The best rule in doubtful cases is rather to incline to acquittal than conviction. Quod dubitis ne feceris. Where you are doubtful, never act. That is, if you doubt of the prisoner's guilt, never declare him guilty. This is always the rule, especially in cases of life. Another rule from the same author, where he says in some cases, presumptive evidence go far to prove a person guilty, though there is no express proof of the fact to be committed by him, but then it must be very warily pressed. For it is better five guilty persons should escape unpunished than one innocent person should die. Adams had a difficult start to his opening in the sense that it was a challenge because this is not a friendly jury for the defendants and he is one of their own in Boston and are they going to be angry at him? He handles, handles it masterfully. But then he goes on to educate the jury. This is the reason part of his argument. He explains the difference between murder and manslaughter. And that education results in an appropriate verdict. The captain and a number of the others were acquitted altogether. Two were convicted of manslaughter. But that reflected the education 
that they had been given by Adams. And that's how the colonists learned about self-government, was engaging in it. I will enlarge no more on the evidence, but submit it to you. Facts are stubborn things, and whatever may be our wishes, our inclinations, or the dictates of our passions, they cannot alter the state of facts and evidence, nor is the law less stable than the fact. If an assault was made to endanger their lives, the law is clear. They had a right to kill in their Yet if they were assaulted at all, struck and abused by blows of any sort, by snowballs, oyster shells, cinders, clubs, or sticks of any kind, this was a provocation for which the law reduces the offense of killing down to manslaughter in consideration of those passions in our nature which cannot be eradicated. To your candor and justice, I submit the prisoners and their cause. The law, in all vicissitudes of government, fluctuations of the passions or flights of enthusiasm, will preserve a steady, undeviating course. It will not bend to the uncertain wishes, imaginations, and wanton tempers of men. To use the words of a great and worthy man, a patriot, and a hero, enlightened friend of mankind, and a martyr to liberty, I mean Algernon Sidney, who from his earliest infancy sought a tranquil retirement under the shadow of the tree of liberty, with his tongue, his pen, and his sword. The law, says he, no passion can disturb. Tis void of desire and fear, lust and anger. Tis menc sine effectu, written reason, retaining some measure of the divine perfection. It does not enjoin that which pleases a weak, frail man, but without any regard to persons, commands that which is good and punishes evil in all, whether rich or poor, high or low. Tis death, inexorable, inflexible. On the one hand, it is inexorable to the cries and lamentations of the prisoners, and on the other, it is death, death as an adder to the clamors of the populace. Fast forward to today. How secure do you think these rights are today? Most people assume that they are well secured. But remember what Justice Scalia said, it's all about the structure. And if the structure's out of whack due to different factors related to what we call the administrative state, maybe they are not as secure as you might suppose. Just think about the current discussions in Washington about taxes. The question is, for each of the houses, well, how much money do we need? Therefore, that's what we're going to do by way of taxes. Does anybody ever ask? whether Congress even has the authority to spend the money on the things they want to spend. And even if they do, are they really consulting their constituents? That's what started the whole thing in this country. Remember, taxation without representation is a representation very effective if our representatives don't know these things. Earlier in this session, I said I would tie together several things that don't normally get tied together. So here they are on your screen, taxes, searches, definition of crime, and jury. So let's consider taxes first. Where do you go to dispute a claim by the IRS that you owe taxes? Well, they tell you tax court. Well, guess what? There's no jury in tax court. Indeed, tax court is not a court, as Justice Scalia insisted. It's part of the administrative state apparatus. You don't get a jury. Well, I thought I was entitled to a jury trial. Oh, yes, you can go to federal district court. One condition, you pay ahead of time everything that the IRS claims that you owe. Isn't that nice? Who sets the amount that they think you owe? Not you. It's what they claim you owe. How many people can actually afford to do that? Not that many. 
And how about linkages between searches, criminal law, and juries? So let's look at searches. Searches require either a search warrant or a valid exception to a search warrant. But getting probable cause is tied to the definition of crime. That is, the search has to be linked to some crime that allegedly is committed or is about to be committed or has been committed. So it's one thing in state law, that is, the states have statutes mostly today, but those statutes are modifications basically of common law crimes, murder, rape, robbery, et cetera. That's the meat and potatoes of most criminal law enforcement, certainly in big cities around the United States. So probable cause means that there are reasons that have been given to justify a search warrant or if no search warrant is required, that there is probable cause to believe that someone has committed the crime that is allowed for an exception, okay? But what is probable cause tied to? It's tied to the definition of crime. But at the local level, even though there may be abuses, there are basically a certain number of crimes and still there are too many, but it may be two to 300 crimes. And I think that is too many, but in the federal, You've got over 5,000 crimes. In addition, you have, it has been estimated, over a couple of hundred thousand regulations that carry criminal penalties. This really is the definition of lawlessness. That is, in the Federalists, they said, if there are too many crimes or too many laws, you can't have the rule of law because nobody can know what the law is. What does that mean? There is no way the federal government can actually enforce the law in terms of all the possible violations that theoretically fit within these statutes. And to make it worse, the statutes are very broadly, ambiguously written. What does that mean? It is not at all difficult for an officer who wants to target a particular person to find a justification somewhere that gives enough basis for, quote, probable cause to search. Why do we have that situation? All of these crimes that I mentioned that have been created, they've been growing for decades, but the biggest growth spurt occurred beginning in the 70s. Why? Well, you remember back to the first session and we saw the Chicago 7 trial, and that was related to the riots uh, around the Democratic Convention in Chicago in 1968. We also had in 68 Woodstock. In other words, there was quite a social upheaval in the United States, and it was accompanied by some crime. Richard Nixon won the presidency, in, therefore, on a, quote, law and order platform. And members of Congress, without regard to the Constitution, enacted all kinds of federal crimes. Why? Because the public was frightened. And in their fright, they demanded protection. Of course, the federal government has very little ability to protect you because most law enforcement, over 90% of it, is carried on at the local level. But members of Congress running for office are not gonna tell you that they really have nothing to do with it. But what they did, was to give unbelievable power to law enforcement, federal law enforcement. And remember, under our constitution, the federal government is supposed to have no general police power. And now for the right to jury trial. As I mentioned in regard to John Adams, juries were very important places to learn about self-government. If you have to make a decision about a person's life or liberty, you have to be thoughtful and you have to make a choice based on evidence. But you know, many lawyers out there grew up with a book, To Kill a Mockingbird, published in 1960, usually read in high school. So many went on to law school with this wonderful ideal in terms of what they might be doing. Well, the only problem is it's very hard to actually get into a criminal trial anymore, or even a civil trial. 
I was fortunate to have tried many cases to a jury, but that's very difficult today. And are we better off for it? That is to say, how do juries, how do uh, crimes actually get resolved? At the local level where there is such a huge a number of cases, most places, almost all the places in the country rely heavily on plea bargaining. That's a whole different discussion, but it's a way of getting around the need for jury trials. At the federal level, it's a little bit different, but it is the overwhelming force that can be brought to bear on a defendant. How so? Well, I mentioned earlier that some of the protections actually turn against defendants. Indeed, all of the formalities that go on in a federal criminal trial, what they do is to raise the amount of time and therefore money that one has to spend in terms of defending oneself. It is not unusual, except in a very simple federal case like a gun possession, or maybe a drug possession in some cases, it is not unusual in a complicated case for the defense to run into several million dollars. We're to the third part now regarding how to address the challenges. And first of all, <laughs> the challenge of facing me is to deal with some of the very good questions that I've been receiving. These questions are challenging because they are really the think questions that I was hoping would be asked. Remember, I started off each program talking about three think points. Thinking and argument means that there is no easy answer or quick answer by that in that sense. So as I'm answering these questions, I'm not really giving a definitive answer. Why? These are questions that need to be discussed and from on which topics, there are many different perspectives. I'm just trying to get the discussion within the parameters of the Declaration and the Constitution. Within those parameters, there are many and varied viewpoints that are legitimate. So, with the first question here is from Ms. Hawkins of George Mason University Law School, Scalia Law School. So, I'm using this question to go back to the issue of the importance of language and definition. And it also relates to everything going forward in terms of, quote, the terms of debate. What do I mean? Oftentimes, when people are discussing in an argument, they use terms assuming that the person they're dealing with understands the term they're using. But it depends. That is, certain terms can be used easily with an audience that you know. Other terms cannot be. So in looking at this question, Indeed, it's more than one question, it's four questions. The first thing that strikes me is the word paternalistic. That is, the question characterizes part of what Professor Barnett has described as, quote, paternalistic. But to me, my response is, well, wait a minute. What do we mean by paternalistic? That is, I think in terms of a similar word, the nanny state, okay? In certain audiences, I would use the nanny state. But in other audiences, if I were speaking to them and trying to persuade them and they were liberal, I wouldn't use the term nanny state unless I was trying to satirize it and get their attention that way. No, but in terms of our discussion, where we're in the framework that we're talking about, have been talking about, I need to know more about what you mean by paternalistic. Do you mean some sort of heavy-handed, top-down organization, government? If that is a term used to describe the Constitution, then it's completely inaccurate. What the Constitution is designed for is to make self-government possible. So the next question is from Jace Panabianco, also of Scalia Law School. Here's his question. I would like to know how we can reconcile some of the language of the Declaration of Independence with some of our modern territorial gains. He goes on to list Puerto Rico, American Samoa, Guam, Virgin Islands. But he could also have listed the District of Columbia, which is a territory. 
And the quote from the declaration, it's the third of the charges against the King of England. We didn't cover these when we went over the declaration. We merely went over the opening and the close. And in between, I said, was the argument, the argument about the charges against the king. Here's the third charge. He has re refused to pass other laws for the accommodation of large districts of people unless those people would relinquish the right of representation in the legislature, a right inestimable to them and formidable to tyrants only. Well, first of all, this fits in well with my earlier discussion in this session regarding Otis and his claim against the King of England, which as I said, is basically converted or carried over into the declaration. Now, remember that what Otis is claiming is in terms of the rights of Englishmen. And what the declaration is claiming is essentially the same thing. At this point, neither are citizens, but they did have a certain right as Englishmen. That's what their claim is. Okay, now, when you talk about the territories, they are not states to begin with, okay? But that doesn't mean they don't have a right of representation. Their representation is in their local government. There's a government for each of these territories. Yes, it is under the control ultimately of the Congress. If you wanna call that quote paternalistic, fine. But the reality is that those who are born in the United States, including those who are born in the District of Columbia, are US citizens. Those born outside the United States in a territory are not citizens by the Constitution, meaning the 14th Amendment. They're in territories with the government and those in Puerto Rico and some at least of the other territories have been given citizenship by way of statute. So it's not a question of on being, being unrepresented. And nobody was asked to give up their representation. They got more representation than they would necessarily be entitled to. They were given local government, but they're not a state. The next question is from Nathan Gorman of Towson. In the Declaration of Independence, Thomas Jefferson talks about men being endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. But is there scriptural support for such an endowment. Where is it? How are natural rights determined if not directly by God? Interesting question. Well, first of all, remember that the Declaration refers to natural law and natural rights. And I referred to natural law as involving natural reasoning and natural obligation. So the first place to begin to answer your question is to go back to Moses and the Ten Commandments. What do we have there? Do not kill, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness against another. All of those are statements of obligation. And they are obligations that are naturally known by reason, not just by revelation. And from there, over the years, as I said before, there's been a long discussion of natural law. But at the time of the Enlightenment and actually before, there began to be discussion about natural rights. And there was often a confusion between natural law and natural right. Part of that had to do with a shift in perspective that I would relate to the problems created by Descartes and the shift to the subjective viewpoint. In any event, the obligations of natural law can through reason be created or understood in terms of natural rights. This is open to a lot of discussion, discussion we don't have time for, unfortunately, in this session. As described by Cicero and adopted by Justice Scalia, the preparation to be a great orator or advocate is quite intimidating, but don't give up yet. A number of law schools have done a much better job over the decades 
in preparing students for trial and appellate advocacy. But there is something more that Justice Scalia thinks is needed. What's important is, is that law schools know that that's what they're doing, that they're training advocates, that they're not training other law professors. What Justice Scalia was describing is the mindset of an advocate as opposed to the mindset of a law professor. You can be do both, but they're different mindsets at different times. That's the distinction. And also, when he's talking about advocates, he may be talking specifically in that context about trial and appellate advocates. But law school as a whole is training students to advocate, even if you're not in the courtroom or in the appellate court. It's about taking a position and making a reasoned argument. That can happen and does happen in the law office with clients. It can happen in all kinds of meetings. In terms of what we're concerned about defending the Constitution, it's going to happen largely in the public square. And that involves advocacy. It doesn't involve a neutral position towards the Constitution. The difficulty is that law schools for a long time, as opposed to the way it was at the founding and up at least through the 19th century, it was understood that, yes, you were for the Constitution as actually written. Now, in law schools, well, that's just one of two options, maybe. Again, I realize this can appear to be intimidating. But as we go through these remaining sessions, I think you'll get a lot of interesting information that will give you greater confidence in your understanding of the importance of rhetoric and what, how others have done it. Remember that Lincoln and Douglas, not well-educated, educated themselves largely by studying and repeating what great orators had done. And those are the examples that we're going to give you. No matter how well prepared you are, whether you've gone to law school or not gone to law school, when you give a public address, certainly for the first few times and maybe many times, it can be very much intimidating and stressful. Remember the advice or the wisdom of actors, and that is that if they're not nervous before they go on stage, it's not going to be a good performance. So as you pursue in advocating through reasoned argument in defense of the Constitution, don't be afraid. Many people are. Fear of speaking is probably the greatest fear in the United States among people. They're afraid of that. But the attempt to cancel your voice is what's important to resist. But it has to be more than resistance. There has to be a positive attitude in defending our Constitution. There's so much to defend and to defend it well. It deserves it. Again, do not be afraid because even if you do less well than you would like, listen to this final advice from Justice Scalia. It's a, it, one of my favorite Chestertonian paradoxes. A thing worth doing is worth doing badly. Okay, here are the materials, the readings for next session. Thomas Paine, Common Sense versus John Adams and Thoughts on Government. We'll look at Patrick Henry's Give Me Liberty or Death speech and the first paragraph of Thomas Paine's The American Crisis on the Federalist Society website for the book club We'll have more specifics in terms of the particular pages on the longer pieces. Thank you for joining us. Good night.